Beloved, grace and peace be unto you from God who loves us as mother and father and Jesus Christ who always and alone is our resurrected, our risen, our reigning, and our returning redeemer. As we get ready to get into the word on today, we want to be mindful that we are celebrating some 20 plus, excuse me, not celebrating, remembering some 20 plus years of the attack of this nation on 9-11. As you remember those families that were touched, we remember one within our own church family on that day that we lost Sister Ada Mason, and we continue to lift up her name in memory of her legacy. Today, we also want to lift up a very special prayer that our villages begin this weekend. We're praying God's blessing upon those facilitators and those groups that meet every week to bind and move us from just being part of a congregation to being in a community, to being in relationship where we delve into and deal with the word of God and how it applies to our daily living. I want to ask God's blessings upon our villages. That being said, won't you bow in prayer with me as we get ready to hear what I believe God will set us in motion for for the next few weeks. Lord, we thank you as always for the power of your spoken word. We read and record it that you stepped in the middle of nothingness and everything you said to be had to become. I thank you for your written word, the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. Lord, we bless you for the incarnate word in Jesus Christ, who came that we might see what the living word was all about. I ask for your Holy Spirit power now to preach your word, and that those that receive would not only be hearers of your word, but doers also. That together we might experience the fruit of your word in due season. Lord, we thank you for your word. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we do pray. Amen. While I was on sabbatical a few years ago, one of the reflective assignments my therapist gave me to help battle some of the moments of anxiety I was wrestling with, she said to me, I want you to make a list of the scriptures in the Bible that give you hope. And every time you feel yourself overwhelmed or anxious, I want you to recite some of those scriptures. If you were asked to do the same, what scriptures? What promises, what assurances, what guarantees would you list that hold your life together when life's trying to pull you apart? Beloved, one of the reasons you ought to read your Bible daily is not only because it'll make you a better Christian, but because within the word of God, there are some plethora of promises, abundance of assurances, godly guarantees that literally will anchor your faith bolster your hope and hold your life together through the storms that inevitably all of us will sail through, knowing that God will never leave you nor forsake you and that neither life nor death, height nor depth, anything created or anything to come can separate you from the love of Jesus that will hold your life together knowing that there may be some weapons that are formed against you that were meant for evil, but they will not prosper. Because once God gets God's hand on it, God can take what was meant for evil and work it for your good. That ought to hold you through some storms of life. Knowing every morning that it is of the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, that they are new and fresh every day, and that the mercies of the Lord faileth not, that will encourage you through the storms of life. Knowing that you don't have to worry about evildoers, that we don't have to fret ourselves over what they're into, because greater is the God that is in us than anyone that stands against us, that will hold you through some seasons of life. One of the assurances, one of the guarantees, one of the promises that gives me great hope, that anchors my faith, that allows me to hold on through situations of life is to know that we serve a God who repeatedly declares and demonstrates time and time and time again that he will fight our battles. As you look through scripture and look over your life, I'm willing to bet that there are multiple moments when God has stepped in and handled something or someone on your behalf. As a matter of fact, early in the sermon, I'm looking for a witness today. 
I'm looking for someone who knows that God showed up and God shut them up. I'm looking for someone who knows that the odds were against you, but when God put God's hands on it, God leveled the playing field. Looking for a witness that has faced some obstacles and some opposition that you could not handle, but God proved that he could. Want to look at someone who's faced a situation where you were told there was only one possible outcome, and then you prayed and put it in God's hands, and God opened doors that you didn't even know exist. I'm looking for someone who can chat early and amen when you declare that you know we serve a God who will fight our battles. And that's really what I want to remind you of these next few weeks as we get into this new sermon series, The Battle Is Not Yours. I want to look at some moments in scripture when the children of Israel face battles only to find out that they have a God who can handle it. And somebody, you need to know that because the next time you face an obstacle, the next time you have opposition, the next time you find yourself with the odds stacked against you, I want you to remember the battle is not yours and that God's got this. And if we learn to trust in the Lord and follow God's word, God will always intervene on our behalf. As we begin part one of this series, I want to invite you to a familiar passage of scripture that's recorded to us in Joshua chapter 6. As you're turning in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 6, when you get there, you're going to find some events with which you are familiar. The battle of Jericho. The walls of Jericho and how they come tumbling down are known and beloved inside and outside the church. Jericho is Sunday School 101. And you remember the context of Jericho that Moses, under the calling of God, has led the children of Israel out of Egypt. And now after his death, God commands and commissions Joshua to finish the journey. Joshua takes them across the Jordan River. And after marching through Gilgal, they now face the fortified walls of the city of Jericho. And in Joshua chapter 6, we have a record of what goes down. Hear the reading of the Word of God from the New International Version. Prayerful that whatever version you have, you'll be able to keep along. Joshua chapter 6, beginning in verse number 1. The Word of the Lord reads, Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its kings and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men and do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout and the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army, Advance, march around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the Ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the Ark. All this time, the trumpets were sounding. But Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. And then the army returned to camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, 
They marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. Except on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. As we reflect and remember the events recorded in Joshua 6, and we begin this series, The Battle is Not Yours, I want to preach today from the subject, more than a shout. More than a shout than a shout. Look at someone online and tell them it takes more than a shout. In his book, Where Have All the Prophets Gone? Seminary president and preaching professor Marvin McMickle argues that one of the cancers of contemporary Christianity and the modern church is what he identifies as the praise craze. He takes notes of how many sermons have reduced and boiled down the gospel to little more than make a joyful noise. He argues that most of contemporary preaching amounts to little more than sanctified entertainment and not that which instructs us in sacrificial discipleship. He suggests that we are building mega churches that are built on many M-I-N-I gospels and that we're at not adequately preparing people to live in the 166 hours that exist from Sunday praise to Sunday praise. He says, and I quote, giving God some praise, coming to church to get your praise on and being encouraged to shout until victory comes does not necessarily translate into a life that is pleasing God, that in a real sense, God desires, demands, and expects more from the growing believer than simply the ability to praise his name. And I agree with Dr. McMickle that a life as a Christian takes more than praise, and that victory requires more than us knowing how to say amen and shout hallelujah. Now, don't get me wrong, there is a purpose and a place for praise. And we are encouraged to enter God's gates with thanksgiving. There's something to be said about making a joyful noise. The redeemed of the Lord ought to say so. Everything with breath ought to praise the Lord. We ought to learn to bless his name at all times. But may I suggest to you that walking victoriously as a daughter or a son of God requires more than the penchant and the prioritization of knowing when to shout and say amen. It takes more than praise. That, beloved, is one of the lessons that God is pressing upon us as God speaks to these children of Israel who are preparing to face the walled cities of Jericho. Jericho, even archaeologists have found, was the oldest fortified city in the world. The walls of Jericho date back to some 10,000 BC. Archaeological evidence suggests that the walls around that city were 13 feet high and that the watchtowers lifted as high as 28 feet. And with those 13 foot walls and those 28 foot watchtowers, Jericho had never been conquered. Jericho had never been defeated. The walls were impenetrable, and it seemed like a city that could never be conquered by anyone. But the beloved, the challenge of God was much more than the walls of Jericho. The bigger challenge of God was the heart of his people. For you will see that these children of Israel who are now standing to face the walls of Jericho, they've never had a battle before. These people who are about to fight, this is the first time they've had to fight. They've never known a battle with God on their side. They have faced obstacles, but they've never faced opposition. 
Can I preach Bible? If you go back to Numbers chapter 13, when Moses sends spies into the promised land, this generation in Joshua 6, they were children at the time. They watched their mothers and their fathers go into the promised land and come back afraid. They remember their mothers and their fathers not wanting to battle, not wanting to fight, knowing that they could not defeat Jericho. And so this generation has been raised with the memory that Jericho could not be conquered. And even our mothers and our fathers did not want to stand against Jericho. And now God has brought them to the same place. And God is saying to them, you've got to fight this battle. And the bigger challenge of the Lord was not bringing down the walls of Jericho, but rather teaching this people how to partner with the God who will fight your battles. Instructing them on how to walk with God and see God bring down walls in your life teaching them how to hold on to and trust that God knows how to handle your enemies, that God knows what you stand in need of. And if you will trust the Lord and obey the Lord, God will always fight your battles. Most of the times, Melissa, when, when we go to Joshua 6 and we read about the walls of Jericho, we focus on the shout. We focus on the fact that when they shouted, the walls came down. As a matter of fact, you ain't a good Baptist preacher if you don't have a sermon on the power of praise rooted in Joshua chapter 6. If you go out on YouTube and you search sermons for Joshua 6 and the walls of Jericho, 90% of them focus on praising God and how shouting will bring the walls down. And beloved, I'm not here to suggest that praise does not have power or its purpose. But to limit this victory to the shout of Israel is to miss some more important, critical lessons that God is trying to teach. That the walls don't simply come down because of praise and shouting and giving God glory. No, there's more that happens. Listen at the battle tactic that God gives Israel. He said, listen, I know you've got to face Jericho. I know the walls seem impenetrable. Nobody has ever conquered the city before. But this is what I want y'all to do. For six days, I want you to get up once every day and walk around the walls of Jericho. He said, every morning for six mornings, get up and walk around and do it in silence. On the seventh day, I want you to get up and I want you to circle it six times in silence. And on the seventh time, that's when I want you to shout. Make certain you see the tactic for victory. Every morning for six days, walk around the city once. On the seventh day, six times walk around in silence and on the seventh time, I want you to shout. Now, here's the question I want to ask you. If all that was required was for them to shout to find victory, Terrence, why then does God command 12 revolutions in silence? D don't miss this. If all it took was a shout, why not tell them on day one, shout and I'll bring the walls down? No, God says for six times, for six days, be quiet. And on the seventh day, six times be quiet for a total of 12 revolutions around the city with your mouth closed and don't shout until the 13th time. If all it took was a shout, why command 12 times in silence? Well, the easy answer for someone is going to be, well, well, you know, God was sending them on a reconnaissance trip, that they were meant to circle the city to get a lay of the land, that they were meant to march around 12 times looking for weaknesses in the wall, that, that they were sent around the city uh, to map out a strategy for victory, that maybe the 12 revolutions were all about reconnaissance. That seems like an answer but it's too easy. 
I would suggest to you that their revolutions and their circling the city were not about reconnaissance. Number one, because they've already sent spies into the land and they know what Jericho looks like from Numbers 13. Number two, that it doesn't take 12 circlings to find out you can't handle this. As a matter of fact, Tiffany, I would suggest to you that after the third revolution, they already know we can't handle this. It doesn't take 12 times to find out you are outmatched. And God isn't sending them on reconnaissance to find weaknesses in the wall because God's not going to need them to attack the wall. God's going to bring the wall down by himself. So if they already know what the wall looks like, if they already are certain that they cannot beat it, if God is going to handle it by God's self, why then does God tell them to go 12 times around without shouting? Why come? God says, march and keep your mouth closed. Well, well, let me throw out a few ideas that may be some life lessons for us in dealing with a God who fights our battles. May I suggest to you, first of all, that one of the reasons God commands them to get up six days and march around the city and on the seventh day to march six times in quiet, to be silent is this, that God wants them to learn the ministry of presence. God wants them to learn the power of showing up. God wants them to learn to just be there even when you don't know what's going to happen. Listen, every time they circled Jericho, they came to one conclusion. These walls are impenetrable. Every time they circled, they came to one conclusion. This is impossible for us. Every time they circled, they came to the same conclusion. We can't handle these walls by ourselves. And yet, even if they did that on Monday, the commandment of God was to get up on Tuesday and do it again. Get up on Wednesday and do it again. Get up on Thursday and show up again. And here's what God is pressing. Even though you know it looks impossible, I want you to show up. Even though it looks like nothing has changed, I want you to be there. Even though it doesn't look like you can handle it, I don't want you to avoid it. I want you to show up in it. And somebody, the word of the Lord to you early in this sermon is that God is trying to press upon you the need to understand the power of just showing up. When it doesn't look good, show up anyhow. When the prognosis is not in your favor, show up anyhow. When the odds are stacked against you, show up anyhow. When the meeting is about you, show up anyhow. When it looks like it's impossible, show up anyhow. When you see them talking and you know they're talking about you, don't run from them. Walk in the middle of them and say good morning and bless you in Jesus' name because God wants us to understand that there's something powerful about showing up, about being present. The reason I share that is because the enemy will always try to convince you that if it's not going to go in your favor, you ought not show up. The enemy tries to convince you to take the bypass and the long way around. The enemy tells you if the meeting is about you, call out sick. The enemy tells you you ought to be absent without leave. But I came to tell you today that avoidance is not of God. Running from it is not of God. Avoiding it is not of God. Taking the long way around it is not of God. Pretending it did not happen is not of God. Sweeping it under the rug is not of God. Avoiding the conversation is not of God. God says, I need you to show up. It may be ugly, but show up. It may be hurtful, but have the conversation. It may be uncomfortable, but walk in the room. It may be hard to hear, but show up anyhow. It may break your heart, but avoidance can never lead to deliverance. Pastor, say that again. I want you to chat that one. Avoidance never leads to deliverance. Beloved, nothing gets better by avoidance. And the call of God is that I want you to show up. Can I push it? 
Let me tell you why God wants them to show up. Because you're going to find that when God sends them around the city, God tells them to take two things. Boy, I feel like preaching Bible here. God says, don't just go. Take two things with you. Number one, take the Ark of the Covenant with you. Because the Ark of the Covenant is the sign of my presence with you. And so I want you to circle the city with the ark so that when the enemy sees you, they know I am with you. Watch this, because your presence in the situation proves God's power over the circumstance. Don't go say that your presence in the situation proves God's power over the circumstance. That if you don't show up, the enemy will never know that God was there. If you avoid it, the enemy will never experience the power of God. That if you avoid it, God cannot be glorified. And God says, one of the reasons I want you to show up is because when you show up, those around have to realize that I am with you because only I would give you strength to make it through that. Only I can work this in your favor. Only I can give you the backbone to stand in this situation. I want those around you to see me at work in you. And if you don't show up, they'll never know it was me. You are, you are one, one, of the, one of the blessings we have at Alfred Street is we have a generous membership that is faithful in their giving. But I found out that there's some folk who give, and when they give, they want their gifts to be anonymous. They don't want people to know how much they gave and when they gave and how they blessed the church. They, of their own accord, wanted to be anonymous, and we respect that. But let me tell you something. God never wants to be anonymous. God never wants to work in your life in a way that nobody else knows. Whenever God touches, whenever God blesses, whenever God gives strength, whenever God delivers, God wants to do it in a way that everybody around you knows it had to be God. God says, I want your mama to know. I want your children to know. I want your friends to know. I want your frat brothers to know. I want your enemies to know that it was God that brought you through this so you You've got to show up so people know I'm in control of the situation. God says, show up so that my presence can be known. But watch this. Can I push it? That's not all. God wants them to show up for a very particular reason. L listen, I just believe that after a few times circling the city, there were some people who didn't want to do it anymore because they were tired of looking up at the walls and seeing the Jericonians. We're going to make that word up. They were tired of seeing the Jericonians on top of the wall, that you can get tired of seeing your enemy. And the word of the Lord to them is, listen, I'm not telling you to circle 12 times for you to see your enemy. I'm telling you to circle 12 times for your enemy to see you. <laughs> that this ain't about you seeing them, this is about them seeing you, watch it. So I don't just want you to take the ark, watch what he says, take the army with you. Yeah, yeah. Take, take the warriors with you. T take the weapons with you. That when you circle, I want the enemy to see that you've got the army with you, that you've got weapons with you, that you are ready to battle. Tell you why that's a word. Because remember, the last time the Jericonians saw the Israelites, they ran and were scared. The last time they saw them in Numbers 13, their mamas and daddies didn't want to fight. The last time the enemy saw the people of God, they were weak and wimpy. And God says, no, this time I'm raising up a new generation. This time, I want y'all to take the weapons with you. This time, when the enemy sees you, I want him to see a different generation. I want to raise a generation that's blessed and got a backbone. I want to raise a generation that's saved, sanctified, and ain't scared. I want them to see some folk who love Jesus, 
but can also tell you, you ain't going to talk to me just any way you feel like talking to me, that I ain't that scared generation. I'm not going to run from this. You need to know we are different, that God has called us to come prepared for battle. Beloved, I don't know who I came to preach to today, but I need you to know something about me. Don't let this Bible fool you. No, no, no. Don't, don't let coming to church get it twisted. Don't, don't let the robe and the collar and quoting scripture make you think that's all I know. I know some words that ain't in the Bible. I believe on the ministry of laying on the hands. I believe every now and then there's got to be some holy smoke. Don't get it twisted. We are not that generation. We are the generation that is bold in God and courageous in God and not afraid in God and and we will go to battle with the Lord on our side. This is a new generation. Uh, Kim, I was preaching that to someone the other day, and they challenged my Christianity. Uh, they said, you know, Pastor, that, that's not really Christ-like, because Jesus said in red, uh-huh, in Matthew, that if a man slap you on one cheek, you ought to turn the other. That, that if a man slap you on one, you all turn another. And, and that, that, that Jesus did say that, uh, but, but you got you to you correct it in two ways. Uh, number one, Jesus said, if, mm -hmm, if, if, I, I ain't volunteering to get slapped, if. Uh, I, I'm not going to lay down and just let you slap me. You got to catch me on the if. You got to sneak it up on me. God never volunteered me to allow you to slap me. And number two, God said, turn the other cheek. Which means after the second slap, that's all I got. After you get me twice, baby girl, it's on. After you do it twice, brother man, we got to handle it another way. Because I am not that generation from Numbers 13. I am the Joshua 6 generation that says we are not afraid. We are not scared. We do not run. We stand boldly in God and we show up. Do me a favor, chat out there and just tell someone show up. Show up. Lord says, listen, I want you to circle so that they can see my presence and they can see that you're not afraid. But, but watch what else the Lord says. Not only do I want you to learn the ministry of presence, I want you to learn the discipline of silence. Oh, it's about to get hot in here. We run to verse 16 where Joshua says, shout. But before you get to verse 16, you got to get to verse 10. And verse 10, Joshua gives the commandment, don't say a word. That before you learn to shout, you got to learn to keep quiet. Before you open your mouth, you've got to learn to tame your tongue. Before you say what's on your mind, you got to learn to keep some stuff to yourself. And one of the lessons God pushes on us here in letting the Lord fight your battles is that sometimes for God to fight your battle, you got to keep your mouth closed. You got to learn to be silent. You got to leave people wondering, what are you really thinking? You got to learn to smile and not say anything. You gotta learn to bite your tongue and learn to keep your thoughts to yourself. Let me tell you why that's such a difficult world, word, because we live in a world where social media has destroyed the value of silence. Because of social media, everyone wants to tweet what they think, post how they feel. They, they get all of their emotional catharsis out on social media that everything they think everything they feel everything they want to say they put out there and I just believe and you have the right to disagree people talk too much there's some things you need to learn to keep to yourself beloved one of the signs of immaturity is the need to live your life out loud. One of the signs that you're not grown is that you speak everything you think. One of the signs that you still got a ways to go is that whatever you feel, 
you think the whole world needs to know. Beloved, it is immature to live your life out loud. And one of the reasons God demands Israel to be silent and is teaching us the discipline of silence is this. Your presence proves God's power over a circumstance. Your silence proves God's power over you. Let me say that again. That showing up proves God's got power in the situation. Keeping my mouth closed shows that God has power over me. That I don't have to say everything. That some things I've learned to keep to myself. There's an old spiritual our foremothers and forefathers used to sing. And part of the chorus about Jesus says, and he never said a mumbling word. Our ancestors understood that there's some dignity in silence, that there's some rebellion in silence, that sometimes silence is the way you resist, that sometimes silence is the way you shut up your enemy, that sometimes silence is the way to show you're bigger than the situation. That sometimes keeping your mouth closed shows that you're the bigger person, that you're the better Christian, that the Holy Spirit has control over you. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is self-discipline and the ability to learn, I don't have to say everything. Can I push this real quick? The Bible says that Israel was told not to say anything. But that doesn't mean the Jericonians didn't say anything. Can you imagine while these Israelites are circling Jericho, that there have to be some Jericonians on the wall looking down at them, and you know they're teasing them. You know they're mocking them. You know they're making fun of them. Y'all must be crazy. Nobody's ever beat us. Why are you wasting your time? The Jericonians are talking to the Israelites, but the Israelites aren't responding to the Jericonians because they've learned a valuable lesson that I'm gonna press on you today. And that is that everything does not demand your response. Every comment does not need a reply. Every criticism does not need a retort. Every accusation does not need a defense. Every lie does not need clarification. You don't have to respond to everything someone says against you and about you when you know that God is with you and when you believe that God has your back and when you know that God is fighting your battle. Fret not yourself over evildoers, neither be envious of the workers of iniquity. When you know God has your back. Let them run their mouth. Let them say what they've got to say. Let them think what they got to think. Let them call your friends. Let them speak to your family. Let them lie on you. You don't have to respond to everything. That we fight with God when we keep our mouths closed. You, you know where I learned this? I learned this on my cell phone. I, I'm going to help you real quick on your cell phone. When you get a call on your cell phone, it does not immediately answer the call. If, if you got the iPhone like I do, uh, it gives you two options when a call comes in. Uh, there's a green button that you can push that says, I'll take the call. Uh, but, but if you don't feel like taking the call, if, if you don't want to answer, there's a red button. And the red button is called ignore. Uh huh. You can green answer, or you can read ignore because your cell phone is trying to teach you you don't have to answer every call. You ain't got to deal with everybody's issues. You don't have to talk to everyone that's talking about you. Sometimes the call comes in and you've got to learn to ignore it. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but you've got to learn the discipline of pressing the red button on the enemies in your life and declare I'm ignoring some of what you've got to say. Can I push it? Uh, uh, Deuce just taught me something on my phone that I'd never seen before. He's got an app that, that if he blocks, if, if he ignores the same call repeatedly, the phone asks you, do you want us to block them? Don't, don't miss that, that if he ignores it three times, the phone automatically says, do you want me to block? 
Somebody, I want you to learn the ministry of blocking today. <laughs> that there's some folk you don't just ignore. There's some folk you've got to block and declare you don't have access to me. I will not respond to you. You are not dragging me down in this. That I believe God will fight this battle. And I am ignoring and blocking everything the enemy has to say in your life. I feel like preaching right here. Learn to block. Learn to ignore. Learn to keep silent. This is what the Lord says. I want you to, to show up so that they see I'm there and you're not afraid. He says, I, I want you to learn to be silent so that I can show my control over you and that you don't have to respond to everything the enemy says. But here's the last lesson about having these walls come down that requires more than a shout. is to learn to be persistent in your obedience. Learn to persist in obedience. When God gives Joshua the commandment of what to do, God is very specific about what to do, when to do it, and how long to do it. And the challenge Joshua and Israel faces is can you patiently and persistently Obey the word of God. Can you be committed to God's word? Now, before you give an easy yes, I want you to read God's instructions. And you're going to find there's a little disparity between what God commands and what Joshua conveys. When you do your Bible study, God commands them to walk six times and then seven times on the seventh day. And God says, and then shout, and God says, and the walls will fall down. When Joshua conveys the commandment to Israel, he leaves out the part about the walls coming down. Don't miss this. God says, if you obey me, the wall will fall. When Joshua gives the instruction to Israel, he just says, obey. But he never tells them that the walls are going to fall. So watch this. Every morning, they've got to get up and obey the word of God, not knowing what's going to happen. God told Joshua, but Joshua didn't tell them. So every morning, they've got to convince themselves that we will obey the commandment of God even when we don't know what's going to happen that we will do what God said as long as God commanded, the way God ordered, even though we don't know when something's going to happen. Because, beloved, all of us have to learn to wait on God. All of us have to learn to deal with seasons where it seems that God is inactive. All of us have to learn the discipline of being obedient to the word of God even when it doesn't seem like it's doing something right away. And I know that was challenging for the Israelites because if they were like we were today, there were some who circled the city and they were ready to give up. There was somebody who said on day three, we got to stop doing this. Somebody woke up on day four and said, this ain't working. Somebody didn't want to try it on day five. On day six, someone had to say, this just is not working for us. But Joshua has to persuade them to be persistent and obedient, even when the results aren't immediate, even when the fruit doesn't come overnight, even when the victory takes some time. Why? Because the word always works. That's my sermon in a nutshell for someone today. The word always works. If you will persist, if you will persevere, if you will be patient, if you will be obedient, you will find the word always works. Loving your enemy always works. Trusting in the Lord with all your heart always works. Pray without ceasing always works. Pressing your way into worship always works. Faithfully giving of your offering always works. The word always works. I want to share with you 
what Joshua didn't have the benefit of sharing with the children of Israel, the word always works. Isaiah knew it. Isaiah said, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength because the word always works. David knew it. He said, wait on the Lord and be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart because the word always works. Paul understood it when he said, let us not grow weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not because the word always works. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Do me a favor, if you agree with that, won't you put it in the chat right now? The word always works. I've got to leave you now. So here's what the Lord says. Show up so they know I'm there and you're not afraid. Be quiet so they'll see my power over you and know that they don't have control over you. He says, I want you to learn to be persistent in obedience and know that the word always works. And after they learn those lessons, then Joshua has the audacity to say, on the 13th revolution around the city, he says, now that you've shown up, now that you've been silent, now that you've been obedient, he says, now shout and watch what will happen. Joshua says, now lift up your voice. Now give God glory. Now praise his name. Now open your mouth and declare the goodness of the Lord. I, I got to be honest, if, if I was there, I would have to ask Joshua a question. I said, Jay, what's the point in shouting now? Why should I shout now? We've been doing this for seven days and ain't nothing happened. Why shout now? The walls are still up. I'll shout when the walls come down. You want me to praise while the wall is still up and God ain't done nothing in a week? That doesn't seem like a reason to shout. That's not a reason to make a joyful noise. That's not a reason to praise the Lord. I'll shout when he does something. I'll praise him when he answers the prayer. I'll lift up hands when the walls come down. I'll bless him when the cancer's gone. I'll bless him when he gets me through the storm. I'll make a noise when the money's there and the door is open and the job is secure. But it don't make no sense to shout while the walls are up. And listen at the reason Joshua says shout. He says, I want you to shout because God has said he's going to give you the city. You missed it. Shout now because of what God said he's going to do. Uh, uh, you missed it. I want you to praise in the present based on a promise in your future. The question is, can you praise him simply because he said it, even if you don't see it? There, there it is. Can you give God glory if God said it, even though you don't see it? Is there anybody who knows how to praise God on a promise. Who knows how to glorify God for what God said he was going to do. Who knows how to make a joyful noise, not because of where I am, but because of what I believe God is yet to do. Do me a favor, tell someone, praise him on a promise. Uh, uh, let, me, let me close this. Uh, the other day, the boys and I were at the house. It was a Friday night. We decided that we weren't going out for dinner and daddy wasn't going to cook. So we ordered. We ordered on DoorDash. We sent an order through DoorDash to one of our favorite restaurants to bring us our food. Let me tell you how DoorDash works. After you place the order, they let you know the order's been confirmed. After you place the order and it's been confirmed, they let you know when the driver is waiting to pick it up. But here's the shout. After you place the order and the order's been confirmed and the driver's waiting, when the driver is on her way to your house, you get a text message saying that what you ordered is on the way. And, and, and I trust DoorDash so much 
that when I got the text that the food was on the way, I sent the boys downstairs and said, get ready for what's about to be delivered. I know it ain't here yet, but it's on the way. I know we don't have it in our hand, but it's on the way. I know you're hungry and waiting, but DoorDash just told me it's on the way. And if you believe and can trust in DoorDash, if you get excited knowing that what you ordered is on the way, how much more are you to glorify God when God declares to you, I'm going to work it in your favor. I'm going to bring you out of this. I'm going to hold your life together. I'm going to work it for your good. God has given a promise and the promise is on the way. So Joshua says, if you trust that, give him glory right now. If you believe the text you just got, that the battle is not yours, praise him right now. If you believe that the delivery is on the way, get ready for what God is going to do. The battle is not yours, but it takes more than a shout. It takes showing up, it takes learning to be silent, it takes being obedient, it takes praising God, on a promise. God, we just believe today that you are faithful to your word and that what you said you're going to do is already on the way. May that encourage my brother or my sister today to know that you've got this. God says, trust me, my sister, trust me, my brother. I will fight this battle, but don't be afraid to show up Keep some of your thoughts to yourself. Continue to obey my word and praise me on a promise. And watch what God will do. Lord, we put it in your hands now to fight this battle. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, next week we're going to come back for part two of this series, The Battle is Not Yours. But before then, maybe you're in a place today where you're wanting to trust your life in the hands of God. You want to experience how amazing God's love is. And I, my church, would love to share with you God's plan of salvation for you, of what it means to accept and receive Jesus Christ, to become a disciple and a follower of the Lord, to live under the power of the Holy Spirit, to be a witness that makes more disciples. If today you desire to give your life to the Lord, or you desire to become part of this church family, you don't have to live within driving distance. All you've got to do is go out on our website, you'll see a membership form. Tell us a little bit about yourself and we will reach out to you even today to share with you how much God has in store for you. I thank you for being in worship with us over this weekend. Continue to be in prayer as our villages get started. We continue to pray for our nation and those families that were touched in 9-11. Continue to pray for our students and our counselors and our administrators as they go back to school. Let's look to the Lord now to be dismissed. And now unto the Almighty, the All-Wise, the Eternal, the Sovereign, the Omnipotent God, who alone is creator of heaven and earth. To the God who's made himself perfectly known to us, and Jesus who alone is our Christ, our loving Lord, our sacrificial Savior, our resurrected, risen, reigning, returning Redeemer. To the God who chooses to dwell in these earthen vessels of clay, through the sustaining power, promise, presence, purpose, and person of the Holy Spirit. To that all wise God be glory and majesty, dominion and power, from now until eternity. And the redeemed of the Lord who loved the Lord and awaited his return, said amen. I'll see you next week. <laughs>